Peter goes, you look wonderfully well. <laughs> Hello, Jezza. Yeah, okay. Jeremy Cordo, radio legend. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're the legend. Well, I'm, but I'm retired. Well, I don't know. <laughs> are you taking a break or are you really going to retire? I've actually, I've been retired for um, uh, five working days and I'm going mad. Yeah, um, you'll get bored. I mean, I got uh, well, bored. It's I, it's strange, Jeremy. I've got a million things to be doing, yes. including you know um, rewriting uh, Hamlet in fifteen minutes for your son Christopher to star in at the Fringe, <laughs> which I should. Not be everyone doing. can rewrite Shakespeare. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, it's got a, it's a, it's Hamlet in fifteen minutes. Uh, with a one minute encore, and then another one minute encore in Klingon. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, yes. So um, I should be doing that. There's a lot of things I should be doing. I should be thanking a lot of people for you know their kind uh, kindness at my farewell bash the other night at the Playhouse. You took over, over a whole theatre to say goodbye. I, I love I that. I mean, and well, I was very lucky. But there's so many things I, I should be doing. And what I am doing is staring at the walls because I've lost all routine. Yes, you know, you'd go into the ABC at one thirty every afternoon and come home at ten forty at night and yeah. cook dinner or make dinner. I don't cook, um, and uh, that, all that routine's gone. And also yeah. the lack of a producer at your elbow, Jeremy. You'd feel this. You know, what's the number <laughs> of Glenn Doherty, the mayor of, of Playford? And there it is. But now you've got to ring the city of Playford and wait twenty minutes listening to crap. No. Um, before somebody <laughs> bothers to answer the phone uh, yeah. and not connect you to the mayor of uh, Playford, Glenn Doherty. So it's a whole new world. But you've still got the name and you've got the clout, so you've got to put it to good use. And I'm still – I have my Sunday Mail column, uh, which is next year in its 33rd year, which ages everybody yeah. uh, to think that that's been going for 33 years. Oh, I don't years. know, I don't know. I think you probably have to be doing stuff for a hell of a long time before you actually feel comfortable and – uh, you've got the the, the knowledge. I the think too. Uh, I mean, you know, you know more about radio than uh, anybody, really, uh, Jeremy. I suppose, but uh, my it's kind of you to say so. But my I, boss, uh, Graham Bennett, who, who you know at the ABC, who's yeah. been a marvelous boss to me. I mean, he's been uh, what every boss should be: tough but fair, and also indulgent. And what was tough? Tell me what he did that was tough. Well, sometimes you know one would cross a line. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, uh, and uh, etc. But he's always said it takes five years for a radio show to settle, yeah. and you know, to to be part of the landscape. And I think he's right. How long you? were you doing it? Well, yes, 20, yeah, 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 twenty years. Twenty years. Yeah, yeah I think and, you're just getting into the swing of it. <laughs> and I left because I was I, I was basically tired of working nights. Uh, yeah, I had that feeling. That too. shift in, yeah. is. Look, I was lucky and I loved every second of it. I've always said I never had an unhappy day at the ABC. I caused un- other people to have unhappy days. <laughs> well, that's part <laughs> of the job. Occasionally, occasionally. Yes. Part of the job. Yes. Best, best looking back on it, the best time was what? A particular interview or a particular moment? You see, the problem is, and you'd have this, Jeremy, people come up to you, you know, at Small and Whitfield or Scammell's, um, which we both haunt. Yeah, it's yes. amazing. It's I'm the an, fear of missing out. Exactly. And I do miss out on things. I, yeah. I miss out on a lot more than you miss out. Oh. But I'm, I, and then the things you miss out haunt you. Yes, I know. I've got a few of those memories. Uh, I've been, me. There was something recently. I've been ringing dealers to find out whether they bought it. I don't know how But, you I know, it's a funny it. thing. It does – things do turn up again. Mm. There seems to be some sort of cycle or... Often, uh, well, I had a... um, uh, I went to Broken Hill for the anniversary of the Battle of Broken Hill, Mm. uh, which was the only armed conflict on Australian soil during the First World War when those Turks in inverted commas fired on the picnic train and were murdered um, subsequently. And it was the centenary of that in 2015 and I was up there for that because I love the silver city of Broken Hill. I remembered a novel written about it called The Cleansing of Muhammad and I couldn't, now that I'm so addled, I couldn't remember whether I'd owned it or read it or both. I looked for it at home and at work. I couldn't find it. I looked up on A Books, the second-hand book site, 
There was a copy at Adelaide Booksellers in Rundle Moor mm. for $20, $5 postage. I bought it. It arrived two days later. It was my own copy. <laughs> How did they get their with hands on it? With my name in it, with my marginalia. Well, it would have cost more than $20. And I would have probably, you know, occasionally I, you know, uh, sell or give books away and there it was. So I bought my own copy back. So things you, you give up at auction come yes, back to yeah, you too, yeah. don't they? But you look around this room and I can tell you this that everything in this room has been thrown away by someone yes. at least three times yes and that includes yes. me and me <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it, it, it is amazing how you can give things a whole new life even this table i got uh, at auction it's beautiful the uh, but you said see i forget uh, people come up and say oh, i interviewed you interviewed me about you know whatever and of course i have no idea and i say well I'm sorry, I forget everybody, but I forget everybody equally. Yes, you're and, an equal forgetter. And, yes. um, but the, <laughs> the interview is oddly that it's not the great and the good and the famous, and you've interviewed you know, so many of those people, uh, Jeremy, and, and you know, the, the, the bigger the star, the nicer they are generally. Yeah, it seems to be the generally. case. Generally, yes. Um, I think because, you, you know, to get to that level, you, you know, you, you can't be evil. There are exceptions. We won't name them. Kiri Takanawa, <laughs> Charlie Drake. <laughs> um, uh, Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> was he not nice? <laughs> no, I, I just you got the impression he didn't want to be there. Right. Didn't mm. really, something was happening in his mm. life and he, uh, what could you say? And then Robert Mitchum is famous for, yep. Yeah. Nope. Yep. Um, I was terrified years ago to interview Jermaine Greer. Oh, yes. Who wouldn't be? She eats I, people, yeah. I mean, I think she's the most intelligent woman on the planet. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was uh, shaking like a leaf. But then I realised, of course, minutes into the interview, that um, all powerful women are just old pussycats. And she just needed a bit of chucking under the chin and she was soon purring. <laughs> oh, she was, I wouldn't have had the courage to tickle her under she the was, chin. She was fine. But the interviews that stick out were I interviewed two parents who lost uh, um, their son, their only child, to a drunk driver yeah. and were able to say, in, and he was prosecuted, of course, in the court, but were able to say to him in the court and personally, we forgive you. Mm. And I find that extraordinary because forgiveness is such a hard thing but yet it's so essential. Forgiveness leads to grace, grace leads to peace, peace leads to redemption, redemption leads back to forgiveness. And the wonderful prisoner of war of the imperial Japanese, Bill Schmidt, who was in his mid-90s when I first interviewed him, and, you know, those POWs went through hell at the hands of those torturous Japanese. It oh, was just terrible. appalling. Did you ever interview um, Vivian Bullwinkle? No, I didn't. You must have. I think I th- it's so hard because it sometimes is a bit of a blur. But you talk, you, we did. And, and yeah. he, w- this I found remarkable. He, um, on leaving Changi when Changi was liberated, yeah. and, you know, he was a sk- living skeleton... Yeah. And he'd lost so many of his his, his digger mates uh, in those in those appalling years, three and a half years he was in that prison and on the railroad. And he stopped and he turned back and looked at the gates of Changi and he said to no one and everyone, I forgive you. Because he said, if I didn't do that, he said, I would never leave this place. Psychologically, yeah. I would always be here hating. Well, it takes you over, doesn't it? You become a, a victim. It's of, right. Of, 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 and that was yeah. his way of coping. Harry Medlin, the great uh, uh, university physicist and uh, arts administrator, you know, he founded Union Hall, sadly long gone at the university. That was a tragedy. He said, you know, um, no, I'll never forgive those bastards for as long as I live. But he was able to, in his mind, to divide the Japanese into the imperial Japanese who did that in the war to the, and, and be fine with the modern Japanese, which was his way of coping. And, and I can understand that too, you know, yeah. that lack of forgiveness. But Bill Schmidt was extraordinary. And as he left the studio, I said to him, keep breathing, Bill, in his 90s. And he turned back at me and he said, yes... And stay erect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's two things we don't have to do. We, we have, must do, isn't it? Keep breathing and stay erect. 
Tell me, take me back to when you first joined the ABC. What were you doing before that? Well, I was on the bones of my ass, Jeremy. Um, I'd, I'd been, um, I suppose, a controversialist in Adelaide as a theatre critic, as a, um, you know, I've never been a journalist. I have done the work of journalists, no. but I'm not a journalist. I'm not a trained journalist. I've never written a news story. Um, but, um, you know, I write opinion profile criticism. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'd worked a lot in the theatre, um, you know, obsessively really, my whole adult life. And um, I left this country to go um, initially to Ireland but I ended up in Turkey where I taught drama in a university and I had three wonderful years there. Teaching drama in Turkey? Mm, in English at uh, yeah. a university level and that was wonderful and I was directing plays in Turkey and uh, I'd, uh, with some success. But... Um, on my return, I worked at 5AA thanks to Paul Thompson, mm -hmm. who I, I greatly admired, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't really work. I clashed with Bob Francis. We, oh. we can come to him. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it, didn't, it, it wasn't my station. No. It wasn't my, you know, I was wrong for it. And uh, so I was, I was living on my Sunday mail money and I was smoking most of that. It was in those days I was a heavy... Smoker, I still smoke one or two a day now only. Well, that's disciplined. I, I respect yes. that. Well, that, I followed – it's <clears throat> taken years to get to this point, but I followed John Cleese who has for I think 60 years had one senior service cigarette after dinner at night and that is discipline, isn't it? Oh, God, yes. Now, they're not made for no, people with that no. sort of discipline. Oh, no. And um, <clears throat> so, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd been let go by um, – uh, five double A, and uh, um, that was a, a strange moment because I'd never been uh, sacked by anyone before. Really? Uh, no, and um, it's a very common thing in the in the business. They well, see, I'd started reviewing <coughs> movies for Carol Whitelock on the ABC in the uh, mid eighties. Mm. Then I went to D. I was scout a poach to DN with Vincent Smith. Oh yes, Vincent was Smith. was wonderful. Yeah. Did, did you employ him? No, 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 no. Vincent Smith in effect took my job. Mm. Um, oh, because, sorry. No, no, yeah. no, 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 I'm not sorry because look, I tell you what, it's it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a shaggy dog story. Nigel Milan. Mm. Um, I'd been there for 10 years. Mm. <coughs> Nigel Milan who uh, ran Macquarie mm. in Sydney. He was always trying to cope with this, uh, the creative tension that was between John Laws and Alan Jones. Uh, yeah, even more so. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> See, yes. Anyway, um, uh, John, John That'll Laws... That'll never end, will it? No, no. no. John, John Laws' producer was mm. Vincent Smith. Mm. I found out years later that what had happened was John Laws said, I can't work with that guy, I just can't, can't work with him. Mm. Uh, and I think they had very different politics. Mm. And he um, said, well, look, I'll just look around. We've got to can't we? Vincent's a friend. We can't, we can't just... Mm. I tell you what, that, that guy Cordeaux in Adelaide has been there for 10 years. That's enough. I'll, I'll get hold of Paul Linkson and see if we can't uh, just get a gig down there for you. Mm. And uh, Paul was told to uh, just not renew my contract. Oh. Uh, and it was a bit of a shock to me. And I thought to myself, now what? Uh, I probably shouldn't tell you all of this. But, but then you bought the station. Oh, no, there was a bit of time in between. Oh, right. Mm. Uh, well, actually, you see, I wouldn't have been able to buy the station oh. had it not uh, collapsed. Mm. Anyway, I, I uh, went around the corner. Mm. Uh, Stan Barrett uh, was running 5KA. Mm. And I said, uh, Stan, I didn't tell him I'd been sacked. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, Stan. I didn't. Uh, and I said, look, because um, uh, Paul Linkson wouldn't have thought I had anywhere to go. There was nowhere. He was to... a good man, Paul Linkson. Oh, he was a very good man. He was man. a lovely man. And yeah. the, the, the only time anything ever fouled up was when Sydney mm. interfered. And, no, uh, he was, he was, you know, those old school managers were fantastic. Yeah, they, 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 they understood mm. people and yeah. they understood the community. And why can't, why doesn't that happen in modern life, Jeremy? Why can't 
bosses realise that happy people work for them better than unhappy people. Yes, I totally agree with you. And in fact, keeping people happy was when I got into management and ownership. That was my job. Mm. I had to just keep everyone happy. Happy. But you know those old businessmen, Sir Lloyd Jumar at the Advertiser, uh, Sir Edward Hayward at John Martin's, they knew everybody. The only they thing you asked, got was the staff. They asked, you know, how's your, how's your sick mother? How's your kid going at school? They yeah. knew everybody yeah. and they looked after everybody. Yeah. What's happened to that? Um, I guess the, the modern generation probably come out of university or uh, some sort of school uh, which happens to think the world is completely different to those old-time mm, mm. guys. They, and they think, of course, that their interpretation of everything is better mm, mm. than uh, that of yesterday, and it's not. I mean, you speak well of the bridge that carries you over. What works mm. is the thing that should be perpetuated. Mm, mm. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, uh, so you went to KA? Well, I went to KA. I, I said to uh, Stan, look... Um, I've got uh, probably a five or six hundred thousand dollars worth of sponsors mm. a year who are mine. Mm. I mean, I, they are my sponsors. Mm. Uh, I will bring them. Mm. So we did a deal which was about twice the salary that Paul was paying me. Mm. Um, it didn't last. I think it lasted for two years or one year or something. Mm. But it was enough to send five DN broke. And then you bought it. Well, I bought 10% of it with mm. Alan Scott, who bought the 90%. Ah, ah. He was a, a very interesting man. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You don't want to tangle with him. Self-made man. Um, uh, the world according to Alan Scott. I mean... Well, Alan could only talk about one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, and <laughs> I, I had a moment of triumph about Alan Scott in the ABC office in um, studios in Mount Gambia. Yeah. Uh, I was there to uh, broadcast and do something years and years ago and I said to the manager there, I said, oh, what? I'll ring Alan Scott, you know, say hello. What's his number? <laughs> oh, Here's his number, but um, he hasn't spoken to anyone at the ABC for at least a decade. He hates uh. us. So he won't take your call. So I said, oh, give it a go. So I rang and spoke to his secretary, whom I think was called Grace, like his wife was called uh -huh. Grace. Uh -huh. She was long-suffering Grace, <laughs> his secretary. Uh, and so I too was Grace. myself, <laughs> yes. And... Um, uh, because of uh, we were, I was an ambassador of the glorious Port Adelaide Football Club, which mm. he practically owned at that mm -hmm. point. And mm -hmm. because of that connection, he took my call. Mm -hmm. And so I'm chatting away with Alan Scott, the King of Mount Gambia, in, mm. and everyone in the ABC office and studios are pretending not to listen, but ears are flapping. <laughs> <laughs> so he did speak to the ABC uh, that day. Um, so you had that radio, and then the rest is history for you there, Jeremy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. But it wasn't it wasn't smooth sailing because um, uh, Alan Scott sold thirty percent of his ninety percent to SGIC, oh. who decided that what we should do is get the new FM license, ah, yeah. and they were prepared to put six million dollars, mm. not lend, mm. give six million dollars mm. uh, to get the license. Anyway, I, it was just a piece of stupidity. I tried to convince mm. Alan of that, mm. and in the end, I. Uh, I resigned. Mm. So, um, but then I bought it back. At bingo! <laughs> uh, after it had failed again. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, well, you see, you're a smart cookie. So you, you know. No, I was lucky, lucky, exactly. lucky, lucky. Exactly. Pure and um, simple. But everything in life is timing, isn't it? Yes, mm. it is. Mm. And I, I, I think that in your life you get certain opportunities and sometimes you have to bite off more than you can chew and then chew like crazy. Um, I w was invited to go to the ABC to pay tribute to Philip Satchel who was retiring yes. in late 2003. Yes. I remember standing in the outer studio with the then producer Robbie Brecken Ah, dear at, Robbie. At yes. nine o'clock at night and I said, this is a ridiculous time to come out and be a guest on anybody's show, nine o'clock at night, little knowing that soon I would ask half of the world to do exactly the same. <laughs> and uh, 
He said to me, they're looking for someone to take over this show. It could be you. I screamed with laughter. I said I'd be the last person uh, they'd want here. And um, then some weeks later I get a call from the then manager, Gail Bartell, who asked me to audition. And on the day of the audition I had to do a half an hour, uh, a choose a guest, Catherine Lambert, the singer, uh, choose two songs and have a bit of a yarn about something for a half an hour. And on the day of the audition... Uh, the manager, Gail, rang and said, Carol Whitelock is sick, you're on. So I went on that afternoon, cold. I think the first words I ever said were, um, uh, uh, <laughs> hello. It's a start. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then I eventually, you know, later that year, took over the evening show and, and 20 years later left it. Yeah. But it was... It was uh, you know, you learn. I think it's radio. You can either do it or you can't, Jeremy. You can't. You know, it's, it's that. Yeah, you ought to want to do it too, and it's somehow I don't know in your blood or in your heart. Mm. Uh, it's a, uh, a fantastic thing when you think about it. You, 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 you're at, you're sitting in people's uh, ears or yes. in their living room and or it's company. Yeah, it's yeah, companionable, yeah, 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 yeah. isn't it? And also. Refreshingly, it, it's it's of all the media, it's the one with the least interference between you and the listener. No, it's very personal. Or the, or the very consumer. Personal. It's very personal. And it's kind of wonderful what you can do with voices that you couldn't possibly do with television and pictures. Mm. It's the theatre of the mind. Mm, exactly. Um, mm. And but it's I'd, just magical. That's the thing it gets you, really. Well, it's the thing it got me. But I'd clashed with Bob Francis at yeah. Double A. Did you? You never worked with him or employed him? No, 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 no. I never. No, he'd left AD when I was involved with AD, mm. and uh, in the advertiser building. <coughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Tenth yeah. floor. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, he. Um, I was very cross because I, at that time of working with Double A, um, I would do a movie segment with Leon. Leon Byner. Mm. Um, I was this morning on my way to a lunch with Pauline Hanson. Uh -huh. And my view of Pauline Hanson was very different to that of Bob Francis. And, um, and I suppose I was negative about Pauline Hanson. And um, when I came off air, the producer was in tears because um, um, Bob Francis had rung her and chewed her out for what I'd said on air. Uh -huh. And I thought this very unfair. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that very night when I arrived at Double A to do my uh, seven to eight slot with John Vincent, who was a wonderful broadcaster yes, yes, yes. And, lo and lovely man. And a great voice. Great voice. Mm, mm, mm. And he, he, he knew radio. You know, he, anyway, uh, Bob came in and I said, Bob... Um, I've heard you say a million times on air, if you've got a problem with what I'm saying, don't ring the, abuse the producer, ring me and tell yeah. me. Yeah, yeah well, of it. And I said, well, um, why, did, why did you ring and cause the producer to have tears because of what I said about Pauline Hanson? You don't know expletive deleted about <laughs> radio and you are an expletive deleted and you never will. When I beat him in the ratings... <laughs> 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 in 2013, I did not revive this. Good I was, feeling. I, I was actually yes, it was, uh, but yes. I was sad mm -hmm. for him actually because he was legendary and you know and an extraordinary broadcaster at his best. But I don't think I won then, Jeremy. I think he lost. Yeah, I don't think he was the greatest uh, discipline. He wasn't the best disciplined broadcaster you could think uh, of. No, did it mostly off the top of his head. Um, and I always had the feeling that he was just seeing just how far he could of go. But I, I didn't win, he lost, and I felt for him a bit. And <coughs> he, um, you know, he'd, on, if I'd see him in the street, he'd be perfectly nice, you know, yeah. on his gopher, but, or okay with me. But on air, if anybody rang, because we were rivals, and if anybody rang and mentioned my name, he'd say, don't mention that, that name on this show, you know, all of that crap. But it, it came to a, a, re, a really redemptive ending. He was in hospital dying and I was doing a, 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 what I called Girls Gals, which was a, a rip-off of Mel's Girls mm -hmm. on DN mm -hmm. that I had done for years with three women on a panel and um, with Nan Whitcomb, the late Nan Whitcomb was there mm -hmm. that night. 
And from his hospital bed, he rang and he came on air and he said, I'm really enjoying this. This is really good radio and good on to you all and good on to you, Peter. So it was an act of redemption and mm-hmm. I thought it was very kind of him at, at you know, that point in his life and mm. good on to him. I wonder what your next adventure is going to be. Well, I just want to keep working in the theatre and um, I, my... I've had two books published by Wakefield Press recently. The second one, which is a a grief memoir, has done extremely well, I'm happy to say. And um, so there's other books I want to write Mm. and uh, so I shall do that. Although my problem is I don't like writing, you know, which is odd because I've written, (laughs) you know, all my life but I I just don't like doing it. But you're such a good talker, I can't see why you'd waste all of that experience and talent and contacts Mm. and affection that that audience has had for you for so long. Well, thank you. (coughs) It's a waste. um, I think, you know, choosing... Choosing when to go in this business is important, yeah. um, you know, because uh, you, you can stay too long at the fair yes. and um, it was right for me, I think, and um, and there are other things to do. I'm doubting that actually at the moment because, <laughs> you know, at night while I'm sitting there, you know, watching something on television and staring at the walls, yeah. well, I'm this thinking, is, why aren't I working? This is the Wild West and it's interesting in that there are no rules and there are no, no regulations. Mm. It's um, full um, of potential, mm. pregnant with possibilities. Mm. Mm. So I don't know next year. I mean, we're only doing three hours live streaming on a Friday. Mm. There's absolutely no reason why with the number of really good broadcasters that we have in South Australia, mm. a wealth of experience that you just couldn't put together a whole week of programs online mm. like this. We mm. have to find a way of monetizing it. Mm. Um, mm. But it, it, it is, I think, maybe the whole new chapter of radio. Well... Yours is a voice that can't be stilled, Jeremy, and shouldn't be stilled. Well, I just got to use it. If you don't use it, you will lose it. Exactly, and you know it's a sin not to use your gift. It's almost gone, by the way. <laughs> no, it hasn't. <coughs> it's it's croaking. Exactly the same. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, see, that's the thing about radio. Unlike the theatre or any other form of show business or television, mm. see, you really only need a head, a heart, and this much of your throat, <laughs> and on you go. You know, you don't need to, you can be physically decrepit <laughs> or half dead as we all have been on air. Oh, God, yes, yeah. yes, yes. I mean, yes. I missed only, I'm proud of this, I missed eight shows through illness in 20 years and yeah. there are many nights I shouldn't have been there. But no, but it's the work ethic. I, I would, the show must go on. Well, the show must go on. I don't know who said that but <laughs> the truth of the matter is if, you, if that's in your DNA that you just feel guilty about being sick or not turning up, Mm. somehow you have to. That's right. Because part of this is entertainment, Mm. isn't it? Yeah. What's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? (laughs) Oh, several. Quentin Chris said, don't try and keep up with the Joneses. Drag them down to your (laughs) your own level. (laughs) I think take people as you find them too. (laughs) How many times in life... Have someone said? Has someone said to you, "You're going to love this person, and you can't stand them"? No. Or you know, mm. you despair of someone's treatment of others, and yet they're fine with you. Mm. I think that's important. Take people as you find them. And secondly, if you can't be a good example in life, be a horrible warning. <laughs> 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 Goodbye. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank this. you. Don't you think you, you need more stuff in this place? <laughs> you, know, you, you go to the mi- well, for the min- Jeremy has the minimalist look. You there, know, there's, there's, a, there's a chair over here, a table. Everything's white, white, white. Well, white. No, no. Why don't people own stuff anymore? Well, I love stuff. So I do mean, I. If you yeah. don't think there's enough stuff in here, there is always scammels and small and Whitfield tomorrow. I, I'll see you there. <laughs> All right, bless your heart. But thank you, Jeremy, and thanks, uh, Caroline. And I look forward to working with uh, your youngest, Christopher. Oh God bless you. Thank you for taking care of him. Peter Gers, ladies and gentlemen.